This is Jeffrey Madoff, author of Creative Careers. And if you want to learn how to define your best life and have the courage to live it, you should be listening to the More Than Corporate podcast with my friend, Amber Furman. Welcome to the More Than Corporate podcast, where we discuss finding fulfillment, defining success, and living your best life. There's no roadmap to success, no one size fits all answer to fulfillment. I believe it requires us all to be vulnerable and authentic about what we want to accomplish and have the courage to step out of our comfort zone to chase our dreams. Keep listening to hear stories from inspiring people who make it their mission to live their best life every day. Welcome back to another episode of the More Than Corporate Podcast. I am really looking forward to you hearing this amazing interview with Jeffrey Madoff. You know, I love the interviews that I get to do and I love the people that I get to meet, but this was one of my favorite interviews that I've done. Jeffrey's book on creative careers that we're going to get into in just a minute, you know, talks about how the creative side and the business side meet. And as somebody who has always said, I'm not creative, this was a really interesting conversation to have. It really helped to shift that language in my in my mind. So if you guys have not read his book, Creative Careers, if there's a part of you that's thinking that it's only for artists and musicians and creatives in the traditional sense, then you are sadly mistaken. It is a fantastic book for both creatives, business people. And it talks about the way that those two things cross and the way that everybody's a creative, especially if you're an entrepreneur. So this was a really, really amazing interview. And I am so excited for you guys to hear it. B. Jeffrey Madoff is the founder of Madoff Productions based in New York City. Madoff is considered a storyteller and incisive interviewer. He has used those talents to help position major brands such as Ralph Lauren, Victoria's Secret, Radio Music Hall, Harvard School for Public Health, Will Cornell Medical College, and the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, just to name a few. His company also collaborates with ad agencies, public relations firms, and directly with clients to produce commercials, corporate branding films, live streaming events, social media, and branded content. Madoff began his career as a fashion designer. He was chosen one of the top 10 designers in the U.S., then switched careers to film and video production. He has since expanded his reach to include teaching, book and playwriting, and theatrical production. He is an adjunct professor at Parsons School for Design, teaching a course he developed called Creativity, Making a Living with Your Ideas. Every week, Madoff has a conversation with a guest from a wide variety of fields, from artists and entrepreneurs to venture capitalists and business leaders. A book about his class entitled Creative Careers, Making a Living with Your Ideas was released on June 16th, 2020 by the Hatchet Book Group. Madoff has been a featured speaker at Wharton School, NYU Steinhardt, North Carolina State, South by Southwest Brazil, Barclays Bank Accelerator, XRB Labs, Mastermind Group, Google Next, and many others. He has written and is producing a play based on the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame legend Lloyd Price. Its world premiere will be at People's Light Theater in May of 2021. Madoff graduated with honors from the University of Wisconsin with a degree in philosophy and psychology. Madoff was also on the wrestling team, which combined with his academic studies prepared him for a life in the film and theater business. Guys, this interview is so fantastic and I'm so excited um, for you guys to hear it. There were times in it that I had to like stop and remind myself that I was conducting an interview because I was so engaged with what he was saying and I resonated with it so much and I really, really can't wait for you guys to hear it. Really quickly, before we jump into the interview, if you or someone you know has ever said the words, I'll be happy when, I just need to keep losing weight, working hard, building my career, you know, insert whatever in that sentence, and then I'll be happy. If you've ever felt like you've done everything you're supposed to do, and yet life isn't turning out the way you expected, if it seems like something's missing despite others telling you how successful you are, the Define Your Life Mastermind is for you. The most powerful question anybody ever asked me is what does success mean to you? As I've explored this topic on my podcast and with my coaching clients, it has become clear 
that most people don't ask this question enough. The Define Your Life Mastermind is designed to help you get clear on what success means, what a well-rounded life looks like, and what your best life feels like. Once you know that, you can build a business that fits into the life and surround yourself with people who give you the courage to step out of your comfort zone and live your vision. If this sounds like something that you or someone you know needs in their life, please head over to the Define Your Life Mastermind at defineyourlife.morethancorporate.com for more information and you can schedule a call. We can have a conversation, see if we're a good fit to work together. I really look forward to chatting with you. And without further ado, let's jump into this interview with B. Jeffrey Madoff. Welcome back to another episode of the More Than Corporate Podcast. I am here with Jeffrey Madoff and I am super, super excited for this interview Jeffrey has such an amazing history, and you heard a little bit of that from the introduction that you just heard. His book, Creative Careers, I'm in the middle of reading that now, and I'm super impressed with that, and I'm excited for you to hear some more from him. So thank you so much for coming on the show with me. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for inviting me, Amber. I'm I'm ready to dig into this. So I love your story. I love the... Um, history that you have of figuring out, you know, who you are and what success means to you in this creative careers. So let's go ahead and go back a little bit and talk about what you thought your life was going to look like as you're planning your future. Um, as a kid, did you have an idea of what you wanted to be when you grew up for lack of a better term? <laughs> I didn't plan my future when I was a kid, <laughs> you know, the future was what's for dinner you know, what are we having for dinner? That was part of the future. And what's on television tonight? That was another part of the future. <laughs> In terms of some grand plan life path that I was going to take, I didn't have a clue. So when I went to college, I had a double major in philosophy and psychology, and I was on the wrestling team. So the combination of those three things set me up for a career in anything. You know, I tried to get a job as a sage, but the wisdom factories weren't hiring. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I honestly never had any grand plan. And when I hear people say, oh, when I was four years old, I knew that I wanted to be an astronaut. And then I went through astronaut training when I was 11. And finally, when I was tall enough to make it into the space capsule, but short enough to fit, my life took off from there but I always knew I wanted to do that. I guess it's wonderful if you think you know, but I don't know how kids think they know anything. You know, I sure didn't, and I'm still on a path of discovery. Yeah, I love that so much because I feel like so many times we look back and um, I know I look back and think about the fact that I didn't know what I wanted to be. I was actually just having this conversation with my mom um, this weekend when I went home that I had no idea what I wanted to be when I grew up. And so just like you just said, you kind of feel like, well, everybody's talking about how they have it all figured out. Um, and I didn't. And I love the fact that you said you're always on a path of self-discovery because I think that that's so important and has obviously served you well in your creative career. I don't know, because I don't know what the alternative would have been. <laughs> so, you know, I don't know whether it has served me well or not, but I know that I don't have any regrets about it. Would another, awesome. would another path have been more fruitful? I don't know. Yeah, we don't get into those. We don't have to get into those what if games, right? Like we just right. get to live with what we have. So were you always creatively charged or was that something that you kind of learned along the way? When I was a little kid, I always liked drawing. And from a fairly young age, I started writing. And I would write and draw comic strips that would get passed around the school, you know, that the other students just really liked them. And it was like this, this little secret treat that people would read the latest day's comic. And of course that was very cool to me. I could write these stories that got passed around study hall and all that, that people just loved reading it. Hey, do you have the next episode yet? And so that was, that was a lot of fun. But I think that the main thing that helped me was my parents, you know, they encouraged me to do whatever it is that I wanted to do, not by saying it, but because they saw that I liked to draw. 
they would bring me paper. They would, uh, they had a retail store and they had craft paper and they would bring home long things of paper so that I could just do whatever I wanted on it. And they just always encouraged expression. Our, our household, I have a sister, older sister, and our whole household was never kids should be seen and not heard. There was always open discussion, animated open discussion. Uh, and as long as you treated people well, you could do whatever you wanted. So my parents, you know, never put those kinds of restrictions on me of, well, you need to know what you're going to do before you go to college. And, uh, well, how are you going to make money doing that? You know, they, that was never part of the discussion. And I was always industrious. I mean, I mowed lawns in the summer, shoveled driveways in the winter, uh, had a paper route, all of that kind of stuff. So I was always industrious. I uh, had a movie theater in my basement and set tombstones and <laughs> never had a customer who voiced a complaint. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I did all kinds of things. So I always had jobs. I always knew that I liked being busy. The creativity part was just another aspect. I think that the fact that my parents encouraged and supported it because they saw that I like doing it. That's why I think a lot of people don't feel they're creative. Maybe it's their parents. Maybe it's they go to school and it gets squashed in school because you're supposed to follow, do this. I had an art teacher at King's School, Mrs. Turney, who had this robin's egg blue smock she wore and she had her cart that she would wheel into class. And she said, uh, okay, today we're going to do crayon resist. And uh, crayon resist is that there's like some, you dampen the paper and then with the wax from the crayons, the color would take or not take. And I thought, man, this is really not interesting. <laughs> I was probably in fourth grade or something. And I was drawing stuff that was kind of, you know, for me, kind of cool. And she uh, said, what are you doing? And I said, well, it's art class, right? And she said, yes, this is art class, but I gave you an assignment. And I said, well, here's the assignment. I did it already, but I, I'd rather do this. Oh, would you rather do that? And, you know, she said to me, you're not very creative and you should follow instructions. And I said, I thought, you know, that's an inherent contradiction right off the bat. <laughs> uh, needless to say, we did not get along well, but... You know, I think that what happens is oftentimes when you're younger, if you don't follow the rules creatively, you start getting squashed, you get punished. You know, uh, she took my paper and ripped it up. Now, fortunately, I knew I could draw another one, but that wasn't very nice. That wasn't very encouraging. And the crap she was having us do wasn't very <laughs> interesting. I guess another thing that I had learned was how to stand up for myself. That I think is also an important lesson to learn in life. So I think being born into the, a family with the right parents is a, is a huge plus because they never squashed whatever my need was for expression. They never squashed that. They allowed it and encouraged it. Yeah, that is huge. And it's so interesting that you say that about your fourth grade teacher, because until I hit my um, roller coaster ride that we all go on, the only grade I had ever gotten less than a B on until the like second year of college was sixth grade art, because I couldn't shade and it wasn't going to happen. And that's when I decided that I'm not a creative person. Um, there's something that you said, though, that I think is so important. And that's the inability to follow instructions and like, follow directions and getting labeled as that type of person, because that's what I hear almost every entrepreneur say is that I couldn't follow instructions. I'm not employable. It's why I opened my own business. And so it's interesting that when, you know, we we're kids, sometimes that's seen as a negative thing. And as an entrepreneur, that's what gets us through the challenges of needing to problem solve. Well, you're right. And you know, look, there's good and bad in not following rules. You know, when I am driving, I follow the rules of traffic. <laughs> you know, uh, when I am thinking, I like to let my mind wander. 
uh, because that wandering can lead to wondering, which can lead to different kinds of solutions uh, or different kinds of ideas. So yes, I'm an entrepreneur because I'm unemployable on one hand, but on the other hand, I had a lot of jobs, but I started my own business right out of college. But I had a lot of jobs leading up to that, as I had mentioned before. So I think that if you don't follow any rules, you're also can be a pain in the ass. <laughs> uh, I was, in fact, since you brought this up, Amber, uh, I was uh, blackballed from the honor society when I was in high school. I had the grades, but the uh, head of the honor society didn't think that I took school seriously enough. Now, I don't know even what that means. <laughs> But you know, I, I thought honor society was all GPA and you're either in or you're out. I didn't know you could be blackballed from honor society uh, in high school. I, I didn't either. Uh, and I thought, well, that's really weird. I mean, I have the grades. I had teachers that either really liked me or enc and encouraged me or those that didn't. And, th you know, that was okay because I also learned at a very young age what a good teacher was. And I didn't realize that, you know, I just knew that I liked my fourth grade teacher. It wasn't the art teacher, the main fourth grade teacher. Uh, I actually thank her at the end of the book because she was the first teacher that I really felt something for. And she was wonderful. And she encouraged kids to question. And she died when I was like in sixth grade, I was still in elementary school. And I was so saddened because uh, I liked her so much. And looking back, I realized I liked her because she encouraged you to be inquisitive, encouraged you to have opinions. And she encouraged all of these things that are so necessary when you go out in the world and if you wanna have creative expression. And so looking back at who were the good teachers, she stood out to me. And then there was another one in high school who was really wonderful. I say to my students, there are no boring subjects. There are a lot of boring teachers. I think that teaching is a, and I teach, you know, on the college level. I think that teaching is a great and very, very important profession. And I don't think it's valued highly enough in our culture, unfortunately. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. I don't think it's valued high enough. And I also think it's something that everybody should give a shot at some point in time, because I had always thought I'm not going to teach. I don't want, there's no part of that. And then when I got invited to guest lecture at a college in a paralegal studies, because I'm also a practicing attorney here in Las Vegas, um, I was like, man, this is actually not what I thought it was. And you find that your passion for whatever you're teaching comes out and you actually get to be that inspiring voice that somebody may need to make it through whatever they're trying to get through. And, and it's such a empowering and enjoyable position to be in. Yeah. And you, you know, the thing that's interesting is you don't know what that kid's circumstances are at that time. And you can do a lot of good unknowingly just by allowing them to be heard. And you can do a lot of damage also probably unknowingly by shutting them down. And so I think there's a lot of damage that can be done before kids even make it to college. Yeah, so, I definitely agree. You know, so I, I, I think that teaching is so important. And as we learn more about how people learn, we can become more effective. Because to me, uh, teaching is a great way to learn. And I think learning is a process of discovery. And in order to discover anything, you have to have that sense of wonder and that you're going on this mysterious journey to find things out. And that can make it really fun and really effective. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. So as far as your journey goes, one of my favorite things that I read in your book was when you were talking about this clothing company that you had built and kind of figuring out how to do this because, you know, you saw this opportunity and not really 
knowing how to make clothes, but I'm going to figure out how to make this happen. And I think that so many times people get stuck in this idea that somebody has to teach them and somebody has to give them permission to do it. And I loved that part of your, of your story. Can you kind of talk about what that was like for you and, and what you experienced when you were making that decision? Yeah. Uh, so I was working in a small boutique at the time in Madison, Wisconsin, where I went to college. And a dear friend of mine, Kenny Meerman, I don't think you know him. Uh, his mom and my mom grew up together. And uh, he had gone off to University of Arizona and he graduated a year before I did. And he called me up and said, hey, I've saved up some money. You think you could earn a think of a gig that would earn more than bank interest. And I said, well, I see the clothes that we sell and I could always draw. I'll start a clothing company. And he said, okay. The next week I had more money than I had ever had at one time in my life, <laughs> which was $1,500. <laughs> and uh, so I sketched some shirts. I took one of the shirts that I had bought that I really liked the way it fit. And I took it apart, you know, cut it apart where all the seams were just to see what were the pieces to this puzzle that became a shirt. So I could just get an idea of how something was put together. Uh, I was very ignorant, but, and naive, but I wasn't stupid. <laughs> and you know, the difference between ignorant and stupid is if you're ignorant, you can learn. If you're stupid, that's forever. <laughs> and fortunately, I was able to learn. And, uh, but to give you an idea of how naive I was, when I would go into a store and I'd see fabric on the bolt, I thought it was wholesale because it hadn't been made into anything yet. <laughs> uh, I learned that that was not the case. <laughs> uh, but I uh, bought fabrics that I liked some of the uh, people that did alterations for the store I worked in, you know, they were good sewers and they could make these shirts, put them in about 18 of them. They sold out in a day, made some more. They sold out immediately. And there I had, although I didn't call it that then, but looking back now with my professorial hat on <laughs> proof of concept, the stuff actually sold. And so an important thing is that you can't be the only one in love with your idea, you know, because nobody's going to buy it if that's the case. And uh, I got a new line of samples put together, strapped them on the back of my motorcycle, uh, drove to Chicago. Uh, I knew that there were like 18 different boutiques and specialty shops there, and I sold to 15 of them and, uh, you know, got over $50,000 in orders. And that was a lot back then. And uh, I then had another challenge, which is how am I actually going to get this made? <laughs> you know, I didn't really know. And uh, I was fortunate enough to meet people who could help me. Uh, I was shopping for, when I was shopping for fabric at the Chicago Merchandise Mart, which is the big office building that has lots of fabric resources. Most of the people would not talk to me because I was a young kid. I had hair down to here. I had hair and it was down <laughs> to here. And, uh, you know, they didn't think I had any money. And, uh, but there were those who thought it was just a novelty that this young kid was starting a clothing company because that was, at that time, startups weren't happening by young people. It was, that was a whole other era. So I was fortunate to meet some kind, generous people who were able to point me in a direction. Uh, one of them saying, so you're buying all this fabric. Do you know uh, how you're getting this made? I said, no. And they said, do you have a contractor? And I said, uh, maybe. What's a contractor? <laughs> <laughs> and he laughed and he said, look, I'm going to call somebody for you. Uh, you should meet this guy. He can help you out. You know, we ship things to him all the time. He's a very good contractor. He's an honest guy. And that's who the first person was that manufactured for me. If you put yourself out there, you can meet kind, generous people that will help you. And you can also meet people that will take advantage of you. So you have to uh, 
you have to keep your defenses up to a point. Uh, so it's not like everything was hunky dory. There were also times that I got screwed over, but I learned and I only got screwed over in a way once, you know, and, and hopefully as the saying goes, your first mistakes are your cheapest ones. So yeah. that's how I learned how to do it. And within a couple of years, I was chosen one of the top 10 young designers in the United States. Uh, not as impressive as it sounds, because I think there were only eight of us at the time. I had about 110, 120 people working for me and two factories and an office in New York. It was the true trial by fire, which I think is a great way to learn you really learn because it truly is about survival every day. And I actually pulled this out of your book and put a quote for my community together. When you said in your book that money comes and goes, but time only goes. I think that that's so powerful because so many times we get stuck on the, how are we going to do this? And we don't realize that we're running out of time. Yeah. You know, uh, it's really interesting to me, language. And when you think of time and you think of money, you've, we've all heard time is money, right? How did you spend your money? how did you spend your time? You know, did you save time? Oh, did you save money? <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and they're very much equated. But the thing is, there's always money. It does come and go but time only goes. So in the morning when I'm shaving and I see this balding gray head of hair, thinking, God, that used to be really dark and I had hair down to here. What <laughs> happened? Uh, because time only goes. And I learned the value of that, fortunately quite young, uh, that how valuable time is. Now, by the way, that doesn't mean that I don't waste a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> I still do, but I'd probably be a lot worse you know, than I am. <laughs> so what was the driving force for you to go from a clothing company into the video production space? So the overall answer to that is I'm seduced by ideas, you know, and entrepreneurial curse 101. <laughs> yes. Yes. And, uh, I met these people who were, uh, I was asked to get involved to uh, do this movie. Now, I mentioned earlier, I had a movie theater in my basement and that was silent films. Back then it was eight millimeter and uh, actually moved up to 16 millimeter and uh, they were silent. So I took my sister's portable stereo and I would find music and the sound effects, record those, and then that would be the accompanying track to the movie. So I was kind of doing sound editing and putting a soundtrack with the images and all that when I was quite young, loved doing that. Uh, and I think that's an important point is, what did you love doing when you were a kid? What excited you? How can you do something like that as a career when you get older? You know, so when I got involved in this situation, I thought, wow, this is really interesting. And it's the kind of thing that I can only get better the longer I do it. And so I was very seduced by the idea of doing film work. So I taught myself how to shoot, how to edit, uh, and, you know, how to put it all together. And it, the interesting thing is, it's very much like designing clothes or anything else, which is you have an idea. When you have that idea, you have to somehow illustrate or communicate that idea to others. Uh, put together what are the materials that you need, the labor you need, how much does that cost to put that together, how long will it take you to put it together, how much can you sell it for, and can you sell it for enough to make a profit so you can do it again and make more profit and keep your business alive. And I think the protocols and dynamics of business are pretty much the same no matter what you do. You know, you have to value your time, you have to value your efforts, you have to know what the marketplace is and what you can charge to do it, all of those kinds of things. So getting into film wasn't as big as of a leap as one might think. I didn't think, oh God, I know nothing. I immediately was able to recognize how similar this was 
to uh, designing clothing and putting a line together. That's really interesting because I think that so many people look at career jumps and think that they're so different. And when you break them down to their fundamental parts, you realize that they're more alike than they are. Because I would have never thought that designing clothes and, and video production are the same. But when you put it like that, I can see very similar, similar creative elements. Yeah. I mean, it's very much so. And I think that what people don't recognize is that a lot of the walls between different professions are perception, but they aren't really and shouldn't really be obstacles for you to do what you want to do because the protocols of all businesses are the same. You know, so if you're, if you're making dental implants, you got to know what the implant is, what is it supposed to look like, making sure that you've got all the specs right, you've got to get the materials right, you have to get it made and you have to know how much that's going to cost so you can charge the patient and it's got to be enough to keep your practice going. So, you know, if you look at those basic principles, I don't care what business you're in, you face the same challenges and the same protocols. Yeah, absolutely. So before we dig into my favorite part of your book, which is the success element, because everybody who listens to this podcast knows how much I love to talk about your own idea of success. I want to dig into the way that you combine creative and business in your book. And you talk us so well about the business person who thinks their analytical is creative and the creative person has to have some business sense in order to make a career out of this and, and run a successful business. Can you talk about how important it is for those two elements to coexist in any situation? Yeah, and I'm going to answer a question you didn't ask, but it's uh, interesting because it ties right into that. Go ahead, yes. So, you know, the book is based on the class that I teach, Creative Careers, Making a Living with Your Ideas. And uh, when I wrote the book, and I wanted to write that book because I wanted to educate, entertain, inform, and inspire people. And... Uh, my agent went to one of the primary business publishers, presented the book, and they said, why would business people care at all about creativity? Needless to say, that was a no. And uh, the, she then went to another publisher who was major in self-help, which takes in psychology and creativity. Their response was, why would a creative person care anything about business? That was a no. So then the next publisher we went to, which is the one that I went with, was Hachette. And the editor there said, oh, we love your book. We love how creativity and business go hand in glove. That's really great. I thought, wow, they get it. That's really cool. Uh, because there's a lot of mythology out there about creativity, a lot of mythology out there about business. And one of the things that you said was those people who think, oh, I'm very creative. I don't know anything about business. Can't figure that out. Oh, I'm very business oriented, but I'm not creative. And there's this notion of left and right brain thinking. So right brain thinking is uh, that you are great on spatial relationships, abstract concepts, things like that. And left brain thinking is much more methodical, analytical, logical. And if you go online and, and search that, there's all kinds of quizzes you can take to determine whether you're left brain or right brain. There's all kinds of books you can buy, left brain or right brain, all of that. And in 1991, Roger Sperry, who was a uh, neuropsychologist, won the Nobel Prize for split brain theory. It's false. Split brain theory was debunked uh, or disproven, I should say, once brain mapping became much more sophisticated, which was by the middle and late 90s. And what they found was that there was not only zero difference between the brain of a creative person, an artist, or say an accountant, uh, that their brains were indistinguishable because there is so much crosstalk through the both hemispheres of the brain. 
So for years, and people still believe it, by the way, that there's left and right brain, and they'll even identify themselves that way, but that's just a myth. Yet that determines people, and they disqualify themselves from having the ability to figure something out because either, oh, I'm not creative, or oh, I'm no good at business because I am creative. And that's unfortunate because, you know, a knowledge of business is survival, no matter what kind of business you are. If you are an artist, you need to know how much it costs you to do something. How much is your studio rental? How much is your labor rental? How much are your paints and canvases and phone bill and utilities and all that boring stuff? You need to know that so that when you price your work, you're getting enough to keep your business going. So business and creativity do go hand in hand. And if you are creative and you make it to your point to have at least a basic understanding, I don't do my own accounting, uh, but to have a basic understanding of business, you're gonna fare a lot better. And more importantly, you also won't be taken advantage of because you'll have a sense of what it takes and what goes into that business profile. Yeah, and also one of the things that really stuck out at me was, you know, I think that there's kind of a misconception out there about what creativity actually is. I think that people think of creativity and they think of art, um, artistic, or they think of a painter, or they think of, you know, a clothing designer, um, something like that. But you describe creativity as problem solving. And that really kind of hit home for me because I always said, I'm not creative at all. I'm, I'm an attorney. I'm not creative. And then somebody asked me one day, well, how do you defend your clients if you don't have creativity? Because I, I would think you got to get pretty creative to defend somebody. And I was like, well, when you put it that way. And so I think it's really interesting to stop saying I'm not creative because if you're a problem solver, you're creative. And I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, I think that uh, creativity is, is a number of things, but the way that I look at it is, yes, most of it is problem solving. Uh, and the important thing about that is that a person who is creative has a compelling need to affect change. So you could be creative and be a political organizer. You can be creative and be a lawyer. You can be creative and be a storyteller. Uh, I think that one of the things that most creatives share is they have a story about what it is they do. And I think it's really important to also understand why you're doing it. Why do you do what you do? Because then you can deal with the upset and inevitable disappointments and obstacles you're going to confront because you are motivated to overcome those obstacles because your reason for doing it propels you forward, which takes us to, I think, one of the most important aspects of creativity, which is perseverance. Yes. You got to keep going. You know, it's not easy. It's not easy to make a living with your ideas. It's not easy to be an entrepreneur. Most people like to put out these Pollyanna images of who, what their business is. And, oh, we've 10x our business. And all this kind of stuff. Meanwhile, they don't know how they're going to meet payroll the next week. Uh, and I think if there was more honesty around the challenges involved in building and sustaining a business, uh, we could help each other more as opposed to people, I think, essentially being ashamed because they have a fake image of what success looks like and what it's supposed to look like. So they mask it behind... Uh, we allowed to say bullshit on your, Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's masked. And I think that, uh, unfortunately, oftentimes honesty is in short supply, but we would all be better off if we were honest about some of the difficulties we confront, because we can also learn from others about how to deal with it more effectively. Yeah. I'm so glad that you brought that up because I, I talk about that a lot on this show where I talk to some amazing people who have done great things with their life. And, and, you know, I could talk to all these entrepreneurs about how you, like what you have going on right now and your millions of dollars, but I don't care about that. I care about what you had to go through to get to where you are now, because I think that so many times, I mean, there's a million shows out there that talk about what I have now and all my money and how I invested. And that's great. 
But for the entrepreneur that's just starting and then they hit that first wall and they think, well, this guy could do it. I can't. So I just must not be cut out for it. What those things miss are all those times that that person almost went bankrupt. All those times that, you know, you wondered, you know, where your staff walked out on you and you wondered where you were going to get stuff done. Like there's so many challenges that we don't always talk about. And I love that you brought that up because that honesty is so important in helping new entrepreneurs know they're not alone. Right. I love it. So let's move into my favorite part of your book, which was the success element. And when I found out you had a whole chapter on this, I was like, this is my person. So you talk about defining your own idea of success. I've always thought that in artistic and creative careers, this is extremely important, but it's extremely important for everybody to take a look at and define what success really means to them so that they can measure for themselves whether they have succeeded or whether they have failed in a certain task. For you, what does success mean individually? How do you define that for your life? So success for me is being fully engaged in what I'm doing, whether it's being fully engaged in my work or fully engaged and being present with my family. It is being present, it is being engaged, and it is uh, being fulfilled in what you do. And I think that that is not quantifiable. You know, it's not about whether you're making a uh, seven-figure income or six-figure income. I know lots of people that are extraordinarily successful financially who are chronically depressed. And when they get to that level and have all the possessions they want, you know, three, four, five homes, the cars, the everything, but they feel very unfulfilled in what they're doing, oftentimes even suffering from imposter syndrome, because they somehow, when they achieve it, it's like that song, is that all there is? <laughs> yes. And I'm glad that you brought that up because my follow-up question to this, which was crafted because as I continued to ask these questions to guess, I realized that people always talked about success by describing fulfillment. Um, and those things seem to be interchangeable. So then I started thinking, well, what is fulfillment? So for you, does success come first followed by fulfillment or do you have to be fulfilled in order to be successful? I think you, ha I think you have to be fulfilled in order to be successful. You know, but I also think that successful is not a destination, okay? You know, so in a way, the, the question is, when do you feel successful? And that's why I talked about engagement and being present and that sort of thing. But it's not like, oh, I'm a success. Yeah. Well, that journey's done. You know? <laughs> uh, no, because you can feel successful and something happens that knocks your legs out from under you. Uh, it could be financial difficulties. It could be marital difficulties. It could be health difficulties. And all of a sudden, you're not feeling so successful anymore because your psyche is overwhelmed with these other challenges that presented themselves. So I think that success is a process that we try to achieve, but it's temporal. And that doesn't mean that, okay, I've got enough money that I'm secure and my family's secure. I mean, that's a form of success, which is great. Uh, the way that I articulate that for myself is having the ability to say no without catastrophic circumstances. <laughs> you know, that's success to me. No, I don't want to work with you. <laughs> you know? And I can afford to say, no, I don't want to work with you. But I think that fulfillment, which is also a process but when you achieve fulfillment because whether it's you've you've gotten an idea out there the way you wanted to get it out there whether you see that's affected change in people in a positive way uh which i love when, you know it's it's so here's a quick example my my mind is sort of ricocheting around here uh i never talk to my close friends about oh i closed this big deal but I will talk to them about, God, I just got an email from a former student who said, and let me read it to you. And it was like how the class changed their lives. 
and had made them rethink what they thought was important and wanted to do and that they just wanted to thank me. Oh, wow. That's fulfillment. That's really cool. But it's fulfillment with my play when at the end of the play, there's a standing ovation. And although they don't, standing ovations don't mean what they used to, you know, uh, but where intent and result merge. Ooh, and I, I like tell it, you know, and I think that that's, that's really important. Yeah, and I'm really glad that you brought up that it's not a destination because I feel like this is something, especially in my generation where we were taught like school is the way out of, you know, whatever you might be feeling right now, like go to school, become a doctor, become a lawyer, become, and so people would go to school and they would think that this happiness, success, fulfillment was a destination. Like once I get done with school, I'll feel successful. And that's exactly what happened to me. That's why this podcast exists. And so for you, when you say that it's not a destination, I just feel like it's so important for people to hear that real power is finding a way to feel successful in all of your circumstances, finding a way, no matter what circumstance you're in, to be doing something that moves you closer to your definition of success. But as you talk about so much in your book, in order to do that, you have to know what your definition of success is. Mm -hmm. You can't move towards it if you don't know what it is. Right. I love right. that. Well, thank you. So let's um, switch gears just really quickly. And you talked a little bit about the fact that you don't always feel successful or that you're not always successful in <laughs> what you do. And I feel like so many people get hung up on what if I fail? I can't try this because what if I fail you? Phil, what is your take on failure and how do you kind of navigate that in all of the um, adventures that you take? So, you know, there's the kind of pat answer, which I agree with the substance of it, although it sounds a bit Pollyanna, which is, you know, failure is another learning experience. Yeah, yeah. but it feels awful when you're going yes, through it. Yes, it does. You can look back and realize that, but as you're going through it, it hurts and it's difficult. On the other hand, if you are afraid of failure and as a result, you won't risk putting yourself out there in that way, you are missing every interesting opportunity that's out there. So let's put this in the context of today. We're dealing with a horrible global pandemic. There are now 100 or over a hundred different drugs at various stages of clinical trials. And let's look at science for a moment. The goal is how do we put the proper cocktail together of antivirals in order to create a vaccine that can cure and prevent the disease? Well, do you think that any of these scientists, these brilliant scientists on a global scale, give up after the first experiment fails? Of God, course let's hope not. not. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Let's hope not. So science, as they say, is trial and error. Well, that error is a failure. You didn't achieve the result you wanted, but you're on the way to the result you wanted because you know that combination doesn't work. Let's try this combination. So I think in looking at science and looking that failure is a way of life in science, but you persevere because you are going through those failures to get to a result and you learn something each step along the way in terms of what does or doesn't impact on what you're trying to do. So I think that, you know, in my class where it's mostly filled with students who are pursuing creative careers in design, photography, journalism, all of these kinds of things, the first day of class, I'll say to them, uh, how many of you are afraid of failure. And almost all of them raise their hand. They say, well, how many of you allow that to stop you so you won't take the risk? And a lot of them raise their hand. And I said, well, I can tell you now that if you are afraid to risk and afraid to fail and your fear of risk stops you because you want to play it safe, find another profession because you're not gonna do anything interesting in this one. You have to be willing to risk. You have to be willing to fail, but you also have to realize that that failure 
isn't a final step either, just like the science idea. Yeah. So what do you think that it is? Because I think when we talk about scientists and we're like, yeah, of course they keep trying. It would be stupid for them to give up. And then we talk about creative careers or entrepreneurism and we're like, oh my gosh, I don't want to fail. What do you think it is that separates those in the minds of people? Uh, again, myth as to what the actual process is. Scientists understand what their process is in order to achieve a final result that they're seeking, where creatives often think that uh, failure is an end. And failure is giving up on what you hope to achieve. And if you give up, you're never going to move forward. Yeah. So you have to face that difficulty in order to do it. So uh, somebody said to me in an interview recently, well, I heard from uh, a great artist say that you should be willing to die for your art. Are you willing to die for your art? And I said, hell no. <laughs> you know, that's stupid. <laughs> you know, why, why would I want to die for my art? Then I can't do any more art. I'm dead, you know. <laughs> And so I think there's all this drama, you know, would you die for your art? Uh, uh uh no thanks. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll figure out a different path that doesn't involve death because that's about it. So I think giving up on the things that are most important to you, that's failure. I love it. So before we wrap up, as far as the book is concerned, it's available on Amazon, um, anywhere books are sold, or what's the best place to buy it? Amazon, Barnes and Noble, ebook.com, uh, Apple Books, Google Books. Let me say this into my microphone. Anywhere fine books are sold. <laughs> How was that, that? that was a very, very <laughs> good, like late night DJ rendition. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you for giving me the opportunity to, to do that. And what I would love, and this goes for you and any of your listeners who do get the book, uh, please post a review on Amazon. Uh, if you like it. And if you hate it, keep it to yourself. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's kind of the way that it goes. We don't need those in our life. Uh, right. If you don't like it, send an email letting them know so you can delete it. If you do like it, post a review, right? Yeah. And if I could, I'd like to share some, uh, some links with your listeners. Absolutely. Uh, I record my class every week. They can go on Instagram to at a creative career. And on Instagram, there are show, short quotes because, of course, the limit is a minute. But you'll hear some really good things from the wonderful guests that I've had. We just launched our website, which is a creativecareer.com. And uh, you can look there and you will see longer quotes and so on. And I started a group, a creative careers group on LinkedIn, where I'm hoping it becomes a very fertile idea exchange uh, that people contribute and see that's the car that was out your window I know it made it a long way really really yeah. it doesn't feel like we were talking that long and there <laughs> uh, so the LinkedIn group uh, which is hashtag creative careers and it's under my name B Jeffrey Madoff uh, I hope that they will join that if they want to explore the kind of issues we've been talking about with other creative people yeah, and we will post those links in the show notes as well. And then I will also um, tag them when I release the episode post. So oh, as great. far as the Thank Instagram you. is concerned, I've checked out a couple of those before your book was released and they're fantastic. Oh, thank you. And I really like um, the range of people that you have on there from entrepreneurs to artists and creative and business. And, and that's probably the biggest takeaway that I really want people to to take from this is don't judge this book by the cover because had we not had this interview, I may not have read this book because I thought I'm not creative. Why do I need to read a book about creative careers? But the book goes so far into why business people need to be creative and why everybody's creative. And so I just encourage everyone to go out and grab this book because I do think that it's fantastic for every entrepreneur and really any business owner to read in any form. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. So before we wrap up, I have a quick random round that I normally give my guests so that they can kind of get to know you a little bit better. Are you okay with that? I am, but you know what? 
I, I'm going to close the window so we don't keep hearing sirens. I call that the New York Symphony. Are you hearing mm -hmm. it? Um, I don't hear it, but if oh, then no, it, then yeah. if you don't hear it, I just didn't want to screw up your sound. No, no, not at all, and it adds character. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, so quick round around for you. If you could have any profession other than what you do, what would you like to attempt? You know, the funny thing is, Amber, that I have attempted the things I want to do. I wanted to write a book. Uh, I wanted to make films. I wanted to do a play. And so I'm doing them. And uh, because why not? So honestly, there, I was trying to think, you know, because I saw some of these questions in advance. I was trying to think, you know, what other career? I'm too old to be a stripper, you know? <laughs> so, I, you know, I, I don't, I really don't have an answer to that because I'm going after the things that I really wanted to do. That is my favorite answer. And my hope for this podcast is that eventually the people who listen to it will have the same answer because they quit letting fear hold them back. I love that answer so much. Time travel. If you could time travel, where would you go and why? Uh, <laughs> I would go back uh, to 1981 or so and buy as much Apple stock as I could. So by the time I got back to the present, I'd be so wealthy, I could really do anything I want without having to raise outside funds. Yeah, it's crazy how that kind of blew up. Everybody looked at that and said, this will never work. And now like we carry Apple around with us everywhere we go. So I like it. Um, superpowers, skills, qualities, however you want to describe it. What do you think is the most important one that's gotten you through your life? Uh, humor and empathy and curiosity. Love it. Um, books. Other than creative careers, which is something everybody should read, um, what book do you think you recommend the most? I would say a recent book that I highly recommend is The Undoing Project. And it's by Michael Lewis, who I think is just a, an incredibly gifted writer. And The Undoing Project is about Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman who uh, developed the field and won the Nobel Prize. Tversky had died, so he can't get a Nobel Prize. They don't award them posthumously, but Kahneman won. And behavioral economics is how we make decisions and how our mind functions. It's thinking about how we think. And these were two fascinating men, and they literally created this field in psychology. Lewis is an incredibly gifted writer, and it's just a fascinating, fascinating read that will expand your mind. I love it. And then last question, because I am a music nerd, I always have to end with this question. What is your pump up song? What do you listen to to get you motivated? Well, there's a particular musician that I listen to. I could name one of his songs, but I usually listen to lots of them. Okay. And that's Frank Zappa. And okay. the song would be, Willie the Pimp. I like it. <laughs> and uh, it's Captain Beefheart is singing, Zappa is playing guitar, and although the song, and I listen to music all the time, but his stuff is timeless, and that song just kicks it. It's just so cool. I've probably listened to it 20,000 times, and it still takes me away every time I listen to it. I love it. So what most people don't know is that I have a playlist that I release to my community. It's the More Than Corporate Motivational Playlist, and it is everybody's pump-up song that's ever been a, a um, guest on my show. And so I think that people are going to be real interesting, or it's going to be real interesting when people play that playlist and then that pops up in the middle of it. So well, and I've got one other that's on the same <laughs> level, okay? okay, and very different. Okay. And uh, it's from the play that uh, I wrote which is uh, Personality, the Lloyd Price musical. Okay. And it's, the song is Personality, which is just one of the great pop songs of all time. Are you familiar with it? I am not. I'll have to check it out. Cause you've got walk a personality, talk a personality. It's, <laughs> yes. it's, gr it's yes. great. And uh, Lloyd's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Uh, the play about his life is really cool. And it's a fascinating, fascinating life. But that song is one of the most contagious songs you'll ever hear. You just want to move to it. 
it's I love wonderful. it. I love it. So as we wrap up, I know that we have the links for your uh, creative career. If anybody wants to connect with you about your book, about the podcast, follow up for any of that, what is the best way for them to reach you? Uh, message me on LinkedIn. And again, it's B Jeffrey Madoff and uh, they can message me and I will respond. And uh, I'll also mention, because I think you looked at it, madoffproductions.com, which is my production company, and they get a sense of the work that I have done that's not related to this, but the creative work I've done for clients. Perfect. Perfect. Um, I really appreciate you coming on. I appreciate you taking the time to share some of your insight and talk about your book with my listeners. Um, and so thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. Love the questions. It was great talking with you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of the show. I hope that something that was said resonated with you or provided value to you in one way or another. I'd love to hear more about your thoughts on the show. You can reach out to me on Facebook or Instagram at Amber Furman. Also, I've created a Facebook community for followers of the show to interact with me and other members of the community. You can find that on Facebook at More Than Corporate. So go ahead and join that group if you'd like to stay up to date on podcast happenings and meet some really cool people. Again, thanks so much for tuning in.